Ladies and gentlemen, the last but not least rule applies in this case. Specifically, it's a great pleasure and honor to introduce Gominda K. Bambra to you, who is a professor of post-colonial and decolonial studies at the University of Sussex. Before, she has been affiliated in various functions with the University of Warwick, with the Linnaeus University in Sweden, also with the University of Coimbra, the UHUSS in Paris, and Princeton University. She is the author of the book Connected Sociologies from 2014 and the award-winning book Rethinking Modernity, Postcolonialism, and the Sociological Imagination from 2007. She has co-edited, among many, many other things, a volume on decolonizing the university and a volume on European cosmopolitanisms. She's also active publicly and speaks regularly on the crisis of agencies for in Europe and on questions of citizenship in the light of Brexit. She has set up the Global Social Theory website and is the co-editor of the online journal Discover Society. Her talk tonight will be called Performing Society, Reforming Society from Progress to Reparations, and will definitely add some urgently needed new perspectives on this topic here. So I'm very glad that you made it from the UK, Gominda, and please welcome her, and the floor is yours. So, hello. Um, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me and also for curating this sort of, today in particular as well, the sort of set of lectures that we've had today because, and for me to be able to go last because it enables me to respond to some of the talks that have been, uh, have come earlier and also to respond to some of the interventions that have been made. And this isn't necessarily direct responses, but in the course of what I will argue today, I think you'll find that there's a dialogue that, that's, that's present there. And so my talk today really continues a discussion that I've been having for a while, sometimes tangentially and most definitely in an unfinished form, with various colleagues who are present here in the room. And so I ask for their indulgence in advance, and there's always the space of the discussion for addressing anything that I might have misrepresented in the course of what I go on to say. But what I want to take issue with is that across various academic contexts and also within art institutions, certainly across Europe, but also in South Africa and in other places, there's been a call recently to decolonize, to decolonize our universities, to decolonize our galleries and so forth. And so in this talk, what I want to do is address the recent call that was made to decolonize critical theory that was made by Amy Allen in her book, The End of Progress, Decolonizing the Normative Foundations of Critical Theory. In this book, she seeks to demonstrate both Frankfurt School critical theory's reliance on Eurocentric understandings and wants to decolonize critical theory by, and I quote, rethinking its strategy for grounding normativity. In the talk today, I consider the arguments that have been made by Alan, and I ask, what would it mean to decolonize a tradition of thought that has never acknowledged colonialism or colonial histories? Indeed, as Edward Said noted, that it has maintained a stunning silence with regard to these issues. So as such, I suggest that to pose the question of decolonizing critical theory could be considered, in Spivak's terms, a catacresis. That is, that it's the application of a term to a thing which it does not properly denote. It's a metaphor that spills over its boundaries as it's productively misused, and that it's a concept metaphor without an adequate referent. So rather than decolonizing critical theory, what is needed, I suggest, is to consider the implications of the colonial modern for critical theory's idea of historical progress. In particular, I argue that epistemological justice requires an address of the ways in which colonization and slavery were integral to the Enlightenment project of modernity, structuring both its knowledge claims and its institutions, but rendered invisible to it. It is this legacy, inherited uncritically, I suggest, by critical theory, that requires fundamental reconsideration. My own concern with epistemological justice, and this I define as the recognition of the knowledge claims of others in terms both of respect 
and reconstructive response is not unconnected to concerns with justice in the world. And it's precisely because I'm interested in the latter that I wish to consider the ways in which the very forms of knowledge and knowledge production contribute or not to this endeavor. So while I think that Allen asks the necessary questions about critical theory's complicity with imperialist meta-narratives, the solution for her seems to be primarily to transform, that is in her words, to decolonize, its approach to grounding normativity. As such, the issue for Allen is not straightforwardly to call into question the normative inheritance of modernity, that is, the idea that modernity does represent progress. Rather, she argues, drawing on Adorno and Foucault, that what we need to do is problematize our own point of view in order to more fully realize its central value, namely freedom. The issue, however, I would suggest, is the extent to which the normative foundations can be decolonized without addressing the explanatory claims about modern society that are integral to its foundations. As Tuck and Yang have forcefully reminded us, decolonization is not a metaphor. As important as the project to transform critical theory may be, it is apposite to ask whether the particular transformation being proposed would constitute decolonization. If so, then it would need to be demonstrated how it would be so. As Horkheimer initially set out, critical theory never aims, and I'm quoting, at, a sim at simply at an increase of knowledge as such. Its goal is man's em emancipation from slavery. One question that is immediately raised, however, is how a theory of emancipation and especially one that seeks to realize the practical aim of emancipating humanity from slavery, can fail to take into consideration the implications of the modern actual form of slavery, that is chattel slavery, for the constitution of the Enlightenment and Enlightenment thought. The place of critical theory between and across the disciplines of philosophy and sociology points to two particular aspects that define its project. The first is normative and concerned with the nature of an imminent project of reason. And the second is substantive, associating that project and its conditions of possibility with a theory of society and social development. Critical theory presents itself as inheriting the Enlightenment project and moving beyond it. If we see Enlightenment philosophy as coalescing around liberal ideas of subjectivity, the private individual, sovereign and self-determined, then the philosophical tradition of critical theory is represented by critical engagements with this idea. In particular, it seeks to restore a social self-understanding of the individualized subject, and it points to the importance of recognizing its formation in relations of interdependence. In relation to its engagement with the sociological tradition, that is, critical theory's theory of society, we see that at the outset, the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory was closely associated with the Marxist theory of society and a belief in the necessity of radical socioeconomic change. This set critical theory apart from sociology in that in their own terms, sociology was seen to be based on traditional rather than critical thought. Across the generations, however, from Horkheimer to Habermas to Honneth, there appears to be a diminished role for Marxism, with Weber coming to replace Marx as a key figure. With this, the Frankfurt School could be argued to have come round to a position of confirming the very bourgeois social structures it had previously criticized, and to do so with a common elision of the colonial constitution of modernity, as I will go on to argue. Now, at this point, I've set out this trajectory from critical orientation to modern society to its confirmation briefly and starkly. And there are plenty of people in the room who can correct that, that interpretation if they wish. The key issue that I want to sort of raise at this point is to point to the way in which Marxism provided an initial jolt for the Frankfurt School to go beyond Kant and beyond Hegel and to address issues that were associated with the development of capitalism. 
Now, while a dialectics of class was made central to understanding of society within such a theoretical framework, Marxism itself effaces colonial relations, or at least makes them subordinate to and ultimately transformed by the class relations of capitalism. While the Frankfurt School tradition has come to regard that particular dialectic of class relations as an implausible account of modern society, this has not been accompanied by a take-up of issues of coloniality that were missing or displaced in the earlier version. The possibility, I suggest, is that post-colonial and decolonial theories can provide a further jolt to shift the trajectory away from its current confirmation of modernity and modern social structures to address more thoroughly the colonial inheritance from which it issues. One of the distinctive characteristics of Frankfurt School critical theory, which sets it apart from analytical liberal philosophy, is the extent to which it makes the social central to its understandings. The modern social, or modernity, is seen to be constituted as the outcome of endogenous processes of European history. These include the processes of economic and political change associated with the Industrial and French Revolutions and underpinned by the cultural changes brought about by the Renaissance, the Reformation and the Scientific Revolution. The rest of the world tends to be presented as being outside these world historical processes and further colonial connections are seen to be insignificant to their development. Such an understanding conflates Europe with modernity and renders the process of becoming modern, at least in the first instance, one of endogenous European development. In earlier work, however, I have argued that the historical record is different to that found within standard understandings of modernity and that this framing is contested within historical studies. Now, whilst historical accounts of these events and by implication of modernity itself have not remained unchanged, what has remained remarkably constant has been the historiographical frame of autonomous endogenous origins and then subsequent global diffusion within which these events are located within dominant socio-theoretical understandings, including those of the Frankfurt School. And I would identify two particular deficiencies with these understandings. First, that the endogenous processes deemed significant in the key events of modernity actually had broader conditions of emergence and development. That is, that the revolutions that are identified as European were not constituted solely by European processes, but through the connected and entangled global histories that were the conditions of their emergence. Second, that other global processes usually not addressed by the social sciences, such as colonial extraction, settler colonialism, and the European trade in human beings, are also significant constitutive aspects of the shift to modernity. These latter processes, however, are usually elided in most conceptual framings of modernity. Specifically, what is missing is a systematic consideration of the world historical processes of dispossession, appropriation, elimination, and enslavement as central to the emergence and development of modernity and to its institutional forms. Alongside the persistence of the idea of, of the endogenous European origins of modernity, there is another insistent idea. And this is the idea of progress associated with the development of moral practical reasoning as embodied in and by this meta-narrative. For Habermas, for example, following Weber, modernity represents the progressive rationalization of worldviews and modes of life. As such, it is understood in terms of progress, even if that progress constitutes an unfinished project and one which continually raises new questions of domination and emancipation. It is this idea of empirical historical progress in institutions and in thinking that grounds the claims to normativity made by critical theorists. Together, they provide the context for seeing modern European culture and thought as distinctive in terms of what went before or what are presented as earlier manifestations, that is the pre-modern, 
and in relation to other contemporary cultures presented as the non-modern. In this way, the modern world does not simply exist alongside other worlds, but represents a qualitative break from them and an advance over them. As the historian McNeil suggests, reflecting on arguments made 25 years earlier in his book, The Rise of the West, he says, and I quote, we must admire those who pioneered the modern enterprise and treat the human adventure on earth as an amazing success story, despite all the suffering entailed. Questions of who this we consists of and whether we must celebrate the successes of some despite the suffering of others has formed the nub of post-colonial and other criticisms. The ruptural break seen to be established by modernity, the break that enables Europe to be understood in its own terms without having to take the rest of the world into account, frames the possibilities for the understandings of critical theory and presents an insurmountable problem from the perspective of post and decolonial theories. These theories are based on an understanding of modernity as constituted by coloniality such that modernity does not emerge through separation or rupture, but rather through the connected and entangled histories of colonization. This immediately complicates the understanding of historical progress, which otherwise provides the ground for much critical theory. Amy Allen, exceptionally among critical theorists, engages extensively with post and decolonial theories and their critiques of modernity. She argues for critical theory to engage in a dialogue with post-colonial studies and with the struggles around decolonization and post-colonial politics that she suggests, and I quote, are among the most significant struggles and wishes of our own age. Moving away from the idea of European Enlightenment modernity as playing a crucial role in grounding the normativity of critical theory, Allen pursues an alternative strategy and this uh, for thinking through the relationship between history and normativity. And as I suggested earlier, this draws on the work of Adorno and Foucault, who Allen argues, and again I quote, who offer a more radical, reflexive, and historicized critical methodology which understands critique as the wholly imminent and fragmentary practice of opening up lines of fragility and fracture within the social world. The problem here is that the Enlightenment project and its associated practices have already created lines of fragility and fracture within the social world. These are the aspects that have led post and decolonial theorists to argue against the possibility of a substantiated idea of progress as central to historical movement. The issue is not simply how we think about history or how we think about progress, but how we act in the world on the basis of those understandings. The critique of historical progress is not an academic matter, but points to the activities that have been labeled as progressive and yet have had deeply detrimental consequences on others, and thinking about how repairing those histories would enable us to enact our otherwise stated commitments. Simply decolonizing a tradition of thought or its groundings is not sufficient. Given the focus of critical theory to act in the world, then what actions would be necessary to enliven this act of solidarity? I would suggest that it's the belief in progress that very precisely means that critical theory can make no progress on this topic. That failure comes from an unwillingness to learn in the sense of making core categories and concepts that issue in conversation, rather than simply being the conditions of a conversation which is always tilted to the advantage of the West. As Anthony Bogues argues, the liberal or critical tradition is not the only one from which a dialectic of freedom emerges. There is also a dialectic of freedom that emerges out of the interstices of domination and which in its practice disrupts normalized imperial liberty. So post-colonial and decolonial thought is not simply about creating epistemic fractures within imperialist systems of thought, but seeks also to recognize and to repair the very real fractures that have been created in the social world by particular systems of thought. 
The issue is less that the idea of historical progress should be critiqued, but what the substance of the criticism is and how this can be addressed. And I would suggest that the conflation of moral reasoning with the historical processes of modernity, without addressing how the standardly recognized processes were themselves constituted through processes of coloniality, undercuts the validity of such claims. It's not possible simply to seek to ground normativity by problematizing our own point of view and respecting others who are different from ourselves. We must also acknowledge how some of these differences have been produced through histories of colonization, that is, through histories of domination and subordination. Progress in and for Europe came at the cost of the lives and livelihoods of others, and not to engage with these entangled histories is to give up any authority to speak of the universal. As well as failing to recognize the modern as the colonial modern, the other problem that is key for me within critical theory is that it starts from an unassailable notion of the legitimacy of the modern social order, a legitimacy that is then usually conflated with ideas of moral superiority. Now, I argue that concepts and conceptual understandings matter. How they are shaped by the histories embedded in our everyday understandings matters. This is because the past we acknowledge, and that which we do not, affects political processes in the present, as well as processes of justification of politics. And here I turn to my colleague, as Rainer Force suggests, the space of politics, and I quote, is concerned with the exercise of rule within collectivities. And that the question of justification arises in terms of asking, and I quote again, who can exercise such rule, if at all, over whom, for what reasons, and in what way? Force goes on to argue that rule can only be legitimate if it can be justified, and that this is as much a historical principle as it is an a priori one. However, critical theory appears to be in denial of the colonial and imperial past that was the broader context for the emergence of the modern order that is the basis of its normative understandings. The central form of denial occurs in the absence of any discussion of European colonialism and imperialism and their ongoing legacies when reflecting on contemporary global, social, economic, and political issues and their associated modes of legitimation. Legitimacy is central to the effective functioning of a political system. According to Max Weber, a political system can be defined as the organization of society within a defined territory in which an impersonal administrative body, the state, has the monopoly on the use and regulation of violence. Members of the political community accept the legitimacy of social actions ordered and regulated by the state to which they give consent. As such, legitimacy here requires the association of a particular population with a given territory where the state is responsible for and responsible to that population. This, however, fails to take into account the actions of the state upon populations outside of its self-defined parameters and towards whom there is no relationship of responsibility, but only of appropriation. It is the question of legitimacy, Weber suggests, that constitutes the basis of very real differences in the empirical structures of domination. However, he does not himself address this in terms of the extension of power by European states over communities that did not accept their authority or wish incorporation into their states. And this failure, I suggest, is carried over into critical theory and the earlier critique that was made by Geoffrey. European states historically did not simply exercise their sovereignty within the territorial boundaries of the national state. They also exerted power and violence over territories and populations elsewhere. Sovereignty was only to be respected in relation to other European powers and was not regarded as significant to encounters with peoples or lands beyond Europe. 
Indeed, as Anthony Angi argues, the doctrine of sovereignty was itself explicitly a statement of the relation among European powers, and it allowed the exercise of sovereignty over non-European others as an expression of that sovereignty. This explicitly legitimizes for Europeans the terms of an imperialism that would incorporate the non-European world into the ambit of European powers at the same time as proclaiming their own sovereignty to be mutually inviolable. European colonization lacked legitimacy in three significant ways. And in relation to the earlier lecture, I will suggest that these ways that I'll now go on to enumerate also suggest why colonial rule is different from democratic rule. The two cannot be made the same. First, expansion involved the subjugation of populations who were subject to rule, but not part of the order of rule. Second, this subjugation was organized on the assumption of civilizational and or racial superiority by the invading population. And third, the land and resources of the subjugated population were deemed to be available to the invading population to do with as they pleased. So there was no responsibility to or responsibility for in this context. The basic question of legitimate rule, as Forst argues, is construed as a question of just, and here I'm quoting, as a question of just, and that means justified, non-arbitrary, and non-dominating rule. Justice is not only what counts as just in the society, but what could hold in it in a reciprocal and general manner if those subject to the norms were their free and equal authors." End quote. Could those who were colonized, enslaved, and eliminated consider as just their colonization, enslavement, and elimination? Or conversely, if they were to enact pro these processes upon European populations, would Europeans consider these actions just? If not, then the modern social order, which is regarded as the basis of normative understandings of emancipation and freedom, perhaps requires a rethink. Following other post-colonial and decolonial theorists, I argue for the modern to be understood as the colonial modern, and as such, not governed by a teleology of unfolding empirical historical progress. Progress in the terms of critical theory requires those who were previously excluded and subjugated to wish themselves to be included on the terms of those who were hitherto their oppressors. There is little recognition that the modern social, constituted on the basis of exclusions and modes of subjugation, would need to be reconstructed, both epistemologically and materially. It's almost as if for critical theory, a world structured on injustice could be redeemed simply by taking into account those struggling against the injustice, instead of reflecting on the con continuing complicity of the modern world with that injustice. Returning to Bogues, he argues, it is an interesting argument that suggests that empirical historical progress has occurred and that emancipation and freedom are possible without having to take into account the debasement of humanity that occurs while practicing coercive power over people who have been enslaved and colonized. While Bogue makes his argument in the context of the US, I suggest that it has a much broader implication. Working through the politics of the wounds of colonialism and enslavement has to be done, as he suggests, not as a historical memory, but as a present past. If following Homeward, we think of an approach to learning in which all categories of a dialogue are mutable within that dialogue, then we can begin to think of learning in terms of overcoming problems and of creating new understandings that reconstruct categories and concepts in the process. As Homeward argues, and here I quote, it is engagement with the practical problems, that is problems bearing upon us or bearing upon what is otherwise held to be necessary, that is the only meaningful location for judgments about what is necessary or good, and dialogue is the only means for arriving at a new settled judgment. 
If the problem that critical theory is seeking to overcome is that of relativism, then relativism is also overcome by an approach that acknowledges that standards are created in dialogue and are not simply the condition of dialogue. In this way, learning can be understood as context transforming, but not by that token reliant on aspects that are independent of context. The wish for it to be otherwise is paradoxically a wish to be able to deny the need to learn. This approach is what I would term a reparative approach in terms of thinking about issues epistemologically. And I would suggest that the past and its problems and the way in which they continue through in the present, that it, it is better to understand these issues and approach these issues through reparations. This would mean that those who were previously dominant and those who continue to benefit from these structures of domination have to understand the injustice of that domination and how it structures the modern present. Their inclusion in a future that is just requires them to understand how their frames of understanding are part of the oppression of others. The parallels here with gender justice should be self-evident. Patriarchal practices are not overcome by the inclusion of women under the sign of masculinity. The comments made in relation to Trump illustrate the problems that that would, in, you know, would, would suggest. So why should we not expect the same of coloniality, except that it is constructed as being in the past and not part of the social structures of the modern present? This is the argument for reparations over progress that I argue is necessary for epistemological and material justice. So I'll end now by offering these brief remarks. Amy Cezaire's discourse on colonialism is a searing critique of European civilization. He begins by stating, and I quote, a civilization that proves incapable of solving the problems it creates is a decadent civilization. Writing in the aftermath of the horrors perpetrated by the Nazi regime on European soil and drawing upon the longer histories of European colonialism across the world, Césaire argues forcefully that as it established itself on the brutalization of others, it, that is European civilization, negates its own claim to be regarded as a civilization. Truly, he states, and again I quote, there are sins for which no one has the power to make amends and which can never be fully expiated. 65 years on, Europe and the traditions of critical thought associated with it stubbornly refuse to acknowledge even that it has created any problems and thus there is something for which it need make amends. In this context, what do we call a civilization? that turns away from the histories that produced it and seeks instead to institutionalize mythologies of values which supposedly constitute it. The injustices which disfigure the world we share in common can only be addressed by acknowledging the histories that have produced them as well as the historiographies that have obscured them. We need to give up a commitment to historical progress as the central normative dimension of critical theory in favor of redressing the identified wrongs of the past through a commitment to epistemological justice and to reparations. It is not modernity that is the unfinished project, but rather, as Nelson Maldonado Torres has argued, decolonization is the unfinished project and it is one which a properly critical theory must address. Thank you.